So here is the formal definition of the theta notation. When we say that a function t of n is theta of f of n, we mean that t of n can be sandwiched between two constant multiples of f of n. That is, there exist some constants c1 and c2, which are great, both greater than 0, there exist positive constants c1 and c2, such that the curve for t of n will be sandwiched between the curves for c1 times f of n and c2 times f of n. So t of n can be sandwiched between these two curves. And this applies for values of n that are sufficiently large. So for all large values of n, this condition must hold. T of n must be sandwiched between some two constant multiples of f of n. So the claim applies when for, for large n, that is, for values of n that are beyond some threshold value called n naught. So let's look at an example of uh, this formal theta notation. Let's say, let's say we have a function t of n whose curve looks like this red wiggly curve over here. Let's assume that the expression for t of n is some complicated expression. But to say that t of n is equal to theta of n squared, um, here f of n is equal to n squared. So we are taking an example where f of n is equal to n squared. So to say that t of n is theta of n squared, there must exist two other curves, which I've shown in green color over here. One curve, which is c1 of n squared, must be less than or equal to t of n, and the other curve must be greater than or equal to t of n. So t of n must be, it, it should be possible to sandwich t of n between two constant multiples of n squared. And we are talking about this condition being valid for large values of n. So for example, uh, if you see here, when we start off from 0 and go to the right, the values of t of n, when n is very small, are actually greater than the values of both c1 of c1 times n squared and c2 times n squared. So clearly this is a region where this condition doesn't hold. Well, the first condition still holds, but the second condition doesn't hold. t of n is not less than or equal to c2 times n squared for small values of n. But you can see that once we cross this point over here, let me call it n naught. Once n is larger than n naught, the red curve is always going to lie from then on between these two green curves. So we can actually cut off this part of the graph from conservation. So just imagine, just, just imagine erasing this portion of the graph because it doesn't matter what it is since this, this portion of the graph corresponds to values of n that are small. But once n becomes large enough, we can see that the curve for t of n is going to lie between the curves c1 of c1 times n square and c2 times n square for all n greater than or equal to n naught. So this is 
what we mean when we say that p of n is zeta of n squared. p of n must be sandwiched between two constant multiples of n squared once n is large n. Now, when we, when we, how do we determine what c1 and c2 are? Well, it's not necessary that for any two values that you choose for c1 and c2, this condition is going to hold. All that the definition requires is there exist two values for c1 and c2 for which this condition holds. So even if there are, you know, just a few numbers, just a few pairs of constants for which this, this, this condition holds, p of n is going to be equal to theta of n squared. And this will be clear when we look at examples uh, that follow this video.